Dermatologists and skincare enthusiasts everywhere love retinol due to its ability to stimulate collagen, smooth fine lines and wrinkles, and firm and smooth the skin. However, recent research has illustrated that retinol is actually very harmful to the meibomian glands of the eyelid. And because these glands are critical for the production of the oil in your tears, harming them can lead to dry eye. On my last video about retinol, I had a ton of questions about how to safely use retinol. So in today's video, we're gonna take a look at the safe application of retinol to avoid dry eyes. Welcome to Eye School with Dr. D, where my goal is to arm you with the knowledge you need to take control of your eye health and have the best vision possible. Like and subscribe for videos every week. Welcome to Eye School. I'm your host, Dr. D. The theme of eye school is lifelong eye education, so I always invite you to let me know what you're learning and request videos about new topics. Want to comment? I love hearing from you and continuing the conversation so we can all learn. All right, eye school pupils, let's take a look at today's topic, retinol, and how to use it safely around the eye. Now, I'm no dermatologist, but when it comes to eye health and specifically avoiding dry eye syndrome, I have to chime in on if, when, and how to use retinol. But let's first go over why it's so widely used in dermatology and even as an over-the-counter product. The answer to that is that retinol does all the things that we want. One, it reduces hyperpigmentation and evens our skin tone. Two, it reduces fine lines and wrinkles. Three, it regulates oily skin and minimizes breakouts. Four, it stimulates collagen production. It brightens skin. It increases cell turnover. But why would we use it in the eye area? Well, let's face it, our eye area is susceptible to aging changes. We've got crow's feet. We've got thinning under eye skin that contributes to the appearance of dark circles. We've got 11s between our eyebrows. But all that being considered, I know it's a miracle and I know you want to use it around your eyes, but this eye doc has some concerns about using retinol around the eyes. And that largely centers around the meibomian glands. So the meibomian glands are the tiny oil glands which line the margins of your eyelids, the edges of which touch when the eyelids are closed. These glands secrete oil, which coats the surface of our eyes and keeps the water component of our tears from evaporating or drying out. As the primary purpose of meibomian glands is to secrete the lipid layer of the tear film, many ocular disorders, including evaporative dry eye, blepharitis, styes, chalazians, and ocular rosacea can be linked to abnormal function of these meibomian glands. So they're very, very important for your ocular surface. Briefly, dry eye disease happens because our ocular surface relies on having a homeostatic state. That means that ideally your tears are going to be comprised of a sticky layer, a watery layer, and an oily layer. And when this tear chemistry is thrown off, the resulting imbalance in the formulation of tears leads to inflammation and symptoms of dry eye. That's why it's so important to protect our lids. So bringing it back around to retinol and meibomian glands, there's recent research from Harvard, which I detail in a recent video about retinol, which I'll link above. And what it says is that, well, okay. So this research has to do with retinol and how it impacts our meibomian glands. And what we know is that vitamin A is converted to retinoic acid. Anything with retinol, tretinoin or retinoic acid are to be avoided in the eye area and that's because of documented research that shows that these retinol and retinol derivatives do have a negative impact on our meibomian glands. While retinoic acid is wonderful for the cornea and the epithelial cells, it is a disaster for the meibomian glands. And so anyone who knows about this, eye doctors, um, Dry eye researchers always say the same thing, avoid retinol around the eyes. Now the challenge with this is retinol is not omnipresent, but present in many over-the-counter products. 
A simple search on EWG or the Environmental Working Group shows the types of products and numbers of examples of each. And you can see just how many categories are represented. So retinol is present in a lot of different categories of skincare and cosmetics, and it shows up sometimes in things you wouldn't expect. Like there's even mascaras and different eye makeups that have retinol or a retin, um, retinoic acid as an ingredient. Now, this is a recognized issue within eye care. The Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society actually just recently reviewed candidates for a cosmetics working group. This is something being actively studied by dry eye researchers and some of the best minds in the business. So, do I have to give up retinol entirely? That's probably the question you're asking yourself as you're watching this video. What about just using like a lower percentage or different concentrations? So recently I was fortunate enough to talk with a researcher, David Sullivan, who has extensively studied the meibomian glands, dry eye disease, and remains heavily involved with the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society. And he sort of reiterated to me that the research shows that it is so, retinol is so hard on my Bohmian glands. And so this is my advice. If you insist on using retinol, if it's the only thing that works on your skin and you're looking to even tone, enhance collagen production, get all of those benefits from retinol. My advice to you is this, none inside the orbital bone. Okay, the orbital bone is this bony structure. I want you to, as you're watching this video, take your fingers and feel where you have this bony protrusion. You'll feel it underneath your eyebrows, around the side here, and then down below. Okay, so I don't want any of your retinol going inside of that area. That means, unfortunately, I really want you to avoid this area where you get crow's feet, and I also want you to avoid around the 11s because you're just too close to the eye in this area. I think the best method of applying retinol on your face, if you're going to use it, is to first put on a very gentle eye cream. Whatever works for you. I have an entire video about how to choose eye cream, which you can check out above. But take whatever that eye cream is, gentle, hypoallergenic, all around your eyelids first. If your skin can tolerate it, consider the concept of slugging. So slugging is something that's used in dermatology and aesthetics. It's become sort of uh, all the rage recently, but slugging is when we use a thick occlusive type moisturizer, so often Vaseline, Aquaphor, um, CeraVe overnight ointment to seal in our skincare products and get them to penetrate the skin better. Now, one way to use this concept of slugging is to apply your creams around your eyes, potentially even put an ointment around the eyes, and then apply the retinol to the rest of the face. The reason I like that is it's going to reduce the amount of migration of the retinol to the actual lids. We know that as you sleep overnight, that um, cream, that retinol cream is going to move um, naturally, also as you toss and turn, but having that barrier closer to your eyes is going to minimize how much actually makes it into the eye. So people have asked me, is it okay to use some retinol? Can I still use it on my forehead? Can I use it? elsewhere on my face where I want the results of retinol without harming my, my, my bomian glands and making my dry eye worse. And to that I would say it is possible. I think it's something that you need to experiment with using retinol um, at the level you can tolerate and then maybe putting a barrier cream in between that retinol and your actual ocular surface. All right, so with retinol, you're gonna to wanna to start at the outside edges of the face where the skin is less sensitive. As you put it on your hands, you're gonna apply it at the outside edges of the face. Use a percentage that you've worked up to. Don't start with 1% if you have sensitive skin. You might have to start at a quarter percent and then slowly work up. You may have to use retinol every other day. After you've gotten it at the outsides of the face where the skin is thicker, then you can start applying it to the thinner parts of your face where you have thinner skin like your forehead, your cheeks, neck, ears, etc. I would avoid retinol again in the eye area entirely. I can't say that enough. It is toxic to your meibomian glands and so if you already have dry eye, it is only going to make that worse. 
Think of this area like a sleep mask. This is another visual for you. Anywhere a sleep mask touches is where we should avoid retinol for better eye health. So this is a kitty sized sleep mask because the adult one covered my whole face. But with this mask, it pretty much covers the area, right? It's down to my orbital bones, it's over here in the crow's feet, and it's up here on the 11s. We actually do not want retinol in those areas. And finally, remember that I'm an eye doctor and I specifically specialize in dry eye, which means that the discussion today is from a person who sees my Bohmian gland atrophy and disease every single day. If you're prone to dryness or have sensitive eyes, please avoid retinol in the eye area. A couple healthier alternatives to stimulate collagen and reduce pigmentation. One thing you can consider is IPL finding a practitioner in your area that can do IPL because it has some of the same effects as retinol without being detrimental to your meibomian glands. In addition, LLLT, low level light therapy at home with an eye mask, moisturizing around the eye area and using sunscreen. I can't emphasize enough the importance of using proper sunscreen around your eyes to protect from ever getting wrinkles in the first place. A hat and wonderful sunglasses, big fancy sunglasses that cover as much of your eye as possible are helpful as well. All right, that's it for today's lesson. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. Remember, learning is lifelong, so make sure to stay tuned in in the future by subscribing. I continually update my videos as my understanding evolves, and I wouldn't want you to miss a thing. I'll see you next time.